This is the second and final a series of two lectures on the book of Galatians, and we're studying chapters 3 and 4, uh, the Annunciation, and uh, Paul attempts now through a personal illustration, a legal illustration, and an allegorical illustration to straighten out the disaster that had overtaken the churches in Galatia as they had listened to these legalizers and their lying about the liberty in Christ. And uh, so in this legal illustration, it has six parts to it, and he speaks about Abraham and the law, sinners in the law, Israel in the law, and we stopped with this particular point, Israel in the law. And he says that Israel, uh, that uh, the law in regards to Israel was as a schoolmaster, literally a child discipliner. And J. Vernon McGee has uh, written this about uh, the uh, usage of the law as far as Israel was concerned. He says the key word here is schoolmaster and has nothing to do with a school teacher in a present day context. See, the Bible says that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And sometimes we, uh, we misinterpret that word schoolmaster and we give it a meaning that it did not have back then. He said the term designated a slave or a servant in a Roman home who had charge of any child born in that home. He fed, dressed, bathed, blew the news off. <laughs> I'll start that again. He fed, dressed, bathed, and blew the nose and paddled the son born in that home. When the little fellow reached school age, he took him by the hand and led him to school. This is where he got the name of Pedagogus, child leader. The law took mankind by the hand and led him to the cross of Christ and said, Little man, you need a Savior. The law turns us over to Christ. We are under Christ now and not under the law. Now, the fourth part of this illustration is Christ and the law. Abraham the law, sinners in the law, Israel in the law, Christ and the law. And Christ has done these things for us. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Not only did he redeem us, but he did all this at God's appointed time through a human body. Uh, this statement here is beyond human comprehension in chapter 4 and verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So he redeemed us from the curse, and he did it at God's appointed time through a human body. And thirdly, he unified all repenting sinners by joining them into his own body through spirit baptism. Now, in verses 26 through 29, he speaks about being baptized into the body of Christ. I don't think this has anything to do with water baptism, but it does mean that the Spirit of God now baptizes me into the body of Christ and makes me bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and frees me, frees me uh, from the claim of the law in the Old Testament. And then uh, notice here he says, because of this, in verse 27 of chapter 3, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, there were three great 
divisions in the Roman world at that time. There was racial and religious, and that was the Jew and the Greek. And there was social and class, that would be the bond and the free. There was man's world and woman's world. Now, Jesus Christ has liberated, or let's put it this way, has broken down spiritually all these uh, boundaries, all these barriers. For example, the Jew and the Greek. Uh, Simon Peter was a Jew, and he leads Cornelius, a Greek, to Christ. For you see, there is neither Jew nor Greek in Christ. And then we think of Philemon, who was a slave owner. And we think of Onesimus, who was a slave. And yet Paul writes to Philemon, the slave owner, saying, Receive Onesimus as a brother. Why? Well, because there is neither bond nor free in Christ, spiritually speaking. And then when Paul visited the city of Philippi, he had the opportunity to lead the Philippian jailer to Christ. But before that, he led a woman by the name of Lydia. And both now became members of the church in Lystra. Both were... Uh, uh, in, in the city of Philippi, and both are just as important. Why? Because there is neither male nor female in Christ, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, obviously, there are physical differences between these that we've mentioned here, and there are ecclesiastical differences. God still picks saved men to rule in churches, and he bypasses saved women as far as the leaders are concerned. But spiritually speaking, there's no difference between Jew and Greek, bond and free, and men and women. All right, the fourth thing that Jesus did, he redeemed us from the law. He did it at his own appointed, God's appointed time through a human body, and he unified us all. Uh, into his own body through spirit baptism. And the fourth thing, he thus guarantees our full adoption as sons of God. Uh, notice again, to redeem them, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 5, that we're under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, Paul does not say that the law made us children of God while Christ made us the sons of God. But he does contrast the differences between a child and a son. Now, you see, uh, the Romans adopted their own children. Now, we don't do that. Uh, I have a boy, and I, I may do a lot of things to him. I give him money every now and then. I spank him, and I pray for him, pray with him, and read the Bible, and we fellowship together, play baseball. One thing I'll never do uh, to my son or for my son. I'll never adopt him. I don't need to adopt him. But uh, under Roman law, legal system of the day, uh, the Romans adopted their own children. Now, there is a difference, of course, between regeneration and adoption. And the repenting sinner receives both. And here Paul contrasts here the differences uh, he says, childhood refers to my condition in God's family, while adoption speaks of my position. Through regeneration, one enters into the family, but by adoption, he enjoys the family. See, at a certain time, when the kid might have been 15, 16, 17 years old, then he was formally adopted as an adult, and he enjoyed the responsibilities of the adult member of the family and not the child. And from that point on, the slave, in this case it would be the school teacher, uh, didn't blow his nose or his knees, as I said before, uh, and uh, didn't lead him to school. And if the boy sinned, he was now responsible not to the slave, but he was responsible to his father because he was, he was an adopted mature adult now and not a child responsible to the slave. So... The, uh, the circumstances leading to childhood were private, while those dealing with adoption are public. And a child is under guardians, while an adopted adult has full liberty. And then in verse 7, he says, not only 
did Christ adopt us now and make us the sons of God and freed us from the law, uh, but uh, we are now regarded as sons and not servants. The Israelis in the Old Testament were never really regarded as, as sons of God. Now, it speaks of uh, the nation being God's son, but, but the Israelis were his servants. But in the New Testament, now we are the sons of God. And there's a difference between a son and a servant. A servant retains his old nature, and a son enjoys the nature of his father. A servant has a master, while a son has a father. A servant obeys out of law and fear, but a son out of liberty and love. And then a servant, normally now, there are exceptions, but normally a servant is promised no inheritance, while a son can legally expect to inherit all things. So this legal illustration now. Abraham in the law, sinners in the law, Israel in the law, Christ in the law, the promise and the law. What was the promise? Well, the promise in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 14, the promise that God would make Abraham a mighty nation, the promise that the Gentiles would then later on become uh, the uh, heir to the blessings of Abraham also. And the promise that Abraham received, he would pass on not only physically to the Jews, but spiritually to Jews and Gentiles. And here Paul says that the law could not change the promise. It didn't even set it aside. It was an interjection for a while. But the law couldn't change the promise. And that the law was not greater than the promise. Because the law was set aside and the promise has never been set aside. And then thirdly, the law, and this is hard for some people to believe, but maybe I can illustrate it. The law he said, is not contrary to the promise. Now, you would think it would be, but it isn't. Uh, there are two great men in the Old Testament uh, class, I think, that sort of uh, summarize the plan of salvation. One is Abraham, and the other is Moses. Abraham represents the promise. Moses represents the law. Well, now, how does both those men, how do both those men summarize the plan of salvation? Looks like their message is different. Oh, no. You see, the message of Abraham was this, faith. It was the message of belief. That's the message of faith. So for hundreds of years, the message, as far as salvation was concerned, was believe, 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 believe. But, of course, some weren't believing because there was sin. And so, around 1400 A.D., God, B.C., rather, God emphasized a new word. He didn't introduce it. It had already been known, but he emphasized the new word through Moses, and that was the message of the law, the message, repent, repent, repent. Abraham said, believe. Moses said, repent. Now, you know what? In Mark 1, Jesus came preaching the gospel. You know what he said? Believe, repent, he said, and believe the gospel. And that's the message of the gospel. So you see, the law is not contrary to the promise. The law led up to the very promise and helped prepare for it. But the promise was faith in Christ. Now, the law cannot do what the promise could do. It could introduce it to the child, but adoption had to fulfill it. All right? A legal illustration, Abraham the law, sinners in the law, Israel in the law, Christ in the law, the promise to Abraham and the law, and now the Galatians and the law. The Apostle Paul now returns to his readers, and he said, look, I want to ask four questions. Number one, after being released from spiritual slavery... Why do you now desire to put your chains of bondage back on again? Why do you want to do that? He said, I'm afraid of you. He said, You're, you observe days and months and times and years, and you're bogged down with this legalistic holiday. Uh, Pastor Jerry Falwell said something the other day I thought was very uh, true. 
He said that if somehow uh, a Christian could no longer officially meet together, maybe the law would absolutely prohibit it, and some countries that happens, you know, have to have underground meetings, but if we could officially, uh, we could not possibly meet together to have church services on Sunday, but maybe uh, the government said you have to do it on Wednesday. You can't do it on Sunday. And, uh, well, uh, publicly. That wouldn't bother us at all. Well, it would bother us because it would be an infringement upon our liberties and our constitutional rights, but that wouldn't bother me. I, uh, I can even worship Christ on Sunday, can't you? I mean on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. But, you know, it would practically ruin the Seventh-day Adventists, you see, because they're so tied down to this Saturday thing. And uh, they would... Uh, they would actually uh, change the words of Jesus when he said uh, the Sabbath was not made for, uh, that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. And they would say, oh no, Jesus, you're wrong. It's the other way around. That man was made for the Sabbath, and you've got to worship on the Sabbath. No, Paul says, I'm, I'm concerned about you uh, because uh, you're getting bogged down in this uh, legalistic uh, day and time and season uh, hang up again. And another question he asks, he says, where was that happy spirit once enjoyed between the apostle and the Galatians? Legalism, you see, can produce no real joy whatsoever. And the reason is this. The legalist says about salvation, well, you know, I'm not sure I've got it, and I might just lose it if I have got it. Uh, and there's no joy in that. Uh, but those in liberty say, I've got it, and what's more, I can't lose it. So if I'm not that concerned about my own salvation and about breaking one of those 613 laws, I can have a little more fellowship with you and uh, bear your burdens and, and pray for you and help you and uh, have some fellowship with you. But Paul says, where was that happy spirit? Uh, the spirit of liberty we enjoy, but now we don't have that. You see, you've turned against me. In fact, he reminded them of their past affection for him. And he says that uh, to the extent that if it were possible, they would have been willing to pluck out their eyes for him. Now, this may be what his problem was, uh, and as much as they were willing to maybe he had bad eyes and and uh, maybe they said, oh, Paul, would to God that we've got a little offering here for you, but would to God we could give you our eyes. This may be a clue to his problem here. Well, the third question that he uh, would like to ask him, he said, why have they turned from him, viewing him, their real, uh, I mean, viewing him, which he was their real spiritual mother, as their enemy? And... Uh, they had attached themselves to the false legalizing teachers. Um, you see, they, the legalizers didn't win him to Christ. Legalizers, by the way, are not very good soul winners. I'll tell you why. Because they're so busy in keeping the law that they have no real time for the preaching of the gospel. Um, in chapter 4, verse 19, Paul pours out his heart. And he's angry, not at them. He's angry at the devil. He's angry at the legalizers. But he's so frustrated that they've perverted the grace of God. And he says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. All right, now, he's attempting now to straighten out this disaster. He does it by a personal illustration, he does it by a legal illustration. And now he does it by an allegorical illustration. He reminds them now of two women who had lived and departed this earth. One was an Egyptian by the name of Hagar, and he ties that in with uh, the flesh. And the other, uh, whose name was uh, Sarah, and he ties her in with the spirit. So you have the flesh versus the spirit here. All right, now, Abraham, as we say, had two sons, and he had two wives. One son, his name was Ishmael, and he was born naturally 
from his slave wife, Hagar. By that I mean it wasn't a supernatural birth. Uh, it was just as natural as births are today. God didn't have to step in there. Abraham was an old man, but Hagar was a young uh, girl, and so she gave him a son. So this is his natural slave-born child. And the other son was named Isaac, and he was born supernaturally uh, from his freeborn wife, whose name was Sarah. Now, when they were, when uh, Isaac was weaned, uh, he is ridiculed by Ishmael at this weaning ceremony. And therefore, of course, God ordered Abraham to send away both Hagar and Ishmael. Now, God took care of them, by the way, but he had them sent away from the tent. So here is the application to his allegory now. He's given us a history of it, and here's the allegory application. In this, applica or in this uh, illustration, uh, allegory that he uses, Hagar represents the law, and Sarah represents grace. Okay? Ishmael, the son of Hagar, refers to the flesh and to those who would keep the law, thus remaining slave children. You see, uh, Hagar's son was a slave child, even though he was the son of Abraham. He was a slave child because he was born of a slave. And so uh, that re represents the flesh. Now, Isaac refers to the spirit and to those who would look to Jesus, thus becoming free sons. So he's speaking about two different things here. He's speaking about uh, of uh, legalism and liberty, and he's speaking about the flesh and the spirit. All right, Hagar now, he said, also represented Mount Sinai. That was where the law was given. And the earthly city, Jerusalem, which was the headquarters of legalism. But Sarah now represents the Mount of Olives, at least it's inferred here, and the heavenly city, of Jerusalem, headquarters of liberty. And he says, now for a believer to mix law and grace is to suffer persecution and ridicule, as did Isaac from Ishmael. And a person who is so legalistic has no real testimony before unsaved people, you see. And they ridicule him, or at least they, they don't uh, uh, want to... Uh, to accept Christ, they said, man alive, I've got enough hang-ups now, being unsaved, and I'm trying to, you know, I've got a lot of laws of uh, my own body, I'm trying to fight and control and everything, and, and uh, income tax laws, and why do I want to become a Christian and get all tied up with those 613 Old Testament laws? That's what an uh, unsaved person says to a legalist, and you see, they ridicule, or at least the legalist has no testimony at all, uh, before an unsaved person. Okay, chapters 1 and 2, we've looked at vindication, chapters 3 and 4, denunciation, now chapters 5 and 6, exhortation. You have an exhortation now uh, to stand in the liberty of Christ, and uh, Paul has a desire that he exercises now, or that he expresses. And he speaks about this liberty, the liberty and the legalism of the Jews, the liberty and the license of the libertines, the liberty and the works of the flesh, this liberty and the fruit of the Spirit, this liberty and the duty of the believer, and this liberty and the marks of Paul. All right, now, Paul commands them, commends them, I should say, to the liberty in Christ. Let's look at this now. This liberty and the legalism of the Jews. What does it mean to refuse this glorious liberty in Christ? What were they doing? Well, it means to trade the blessed yoke of Christ for the burdensome yoke of the law. Notice these two yokes. Here's the yoke of Jesus. Jesus is coming to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Bible says his ways are not grievous ways. 
the Bible says, at his right hand are joys forevermore. But what about the yoke of the law? Well, in Acts 15, Simon Peter uh, uh, reminds his uh, hearers when they had this argument about whether the Jews or the Gentiles should be circumcised. He said, now you brethren, Jewish brethren, now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Why have them do it? We couldn't do it. We couldn't keep all this. So here what they were doing is trading a blessed yoke for a cursed yoke. Hey, what would you think of a, of a fine Christian woman who was married to a very legalistic, stern husband? And uh, he really just, well, he wasn't a bad man as far as immoral, but, but he was just so stern that, that he really made her miserable. But she stuck with him, and then he died. And sometime after the funeral, a year or so after the funeral, she was introduced to a fine Christian man. And this man was as generous as he was spiritual. And he loved this woman with all his heart, and he won her heart, and she married him. But then one day, she visited the cemetery, and she was asked, what are you doing out here? And she says, well, you're going to think this is strange, but I'm attempting to resurrect my dead legalistic husband, because I decided I'd like to live with him rather than living with my new husband. Now, how, how insane that would be. And yet, that's exactly what the Galatian believers were attempting to do. Now, another thing it meant when they attempted to refuse the glorious liberty of Christ, it meant to become debtors to the entire Mosaic law. If you're going to break one, you've broken all. I remember J. Vernon McGee saying at Dallas Seminary once that he talked to a Seventh-day Adventist who uh, one of the, it was his neighbor, and he was trying to keep the law, and he said, he said, tell me, brother, he said, have you ever eaten an ossifras bird? And uh, so uh, the fellow said, well, I haven't the slightest idea. He said, well, you better find out. He said, that might be a, a, a name for a chicken or a or uh, a turkey or something that we eat today because we don't know what that word means an ossifras bird but whatever it is you weren't supposed to eat it in the old testament so you see how can you keep all the laws uh, when we're not even sure uh, the full meaning of some of these laws in the old testament but if you're going to refuse the liberty of christ it means you've got to keep every one of them and you better know every one of them and understand it so you can keep it and it means to fall from grace. Chapter 5, verse 4 has been misinterpreted. It says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Uh, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, he's not speaking the fact that they lose their salvation because he continues to call them brethren and children of God. He calls them sons of God even after this. He speaks of brethren. In fact, in chapter 6, after he says they've fallen from grace, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. So he still calls them, they're still say, but uh, as you note in your book here, the Greek word translated fallen here is uh, a word that means uh, not under control. And that's the meaning here in Galatians. This is used in Acts 27. It says the ship was fallen from grace that Paul was in. That is to say, he was not under control. And you know what happened to that ship, that terrible uh, storm and everything? That ship wound up being sunk. And what happened? It was out of control because, you see, the winds were blowing that ship in all different directions. And the ship, was not being controlled in a way that the owners wanted it to be controlled. Now, when a believer puts himself back under the law, uh, the law blows him every which way, you see. And uh, he's going to wind up being shipwrecked, spiritually speaking, because 
the owner of that ship wants to control that ship. And who's the owner? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that's what we do. We frustrate the grace of God and we fall from grace because we wrest control of our bodies from the Holy Spirit and allow the wild wind of the law to blow us hither and yon. And then the fourth thing that it means to refuse the liberty of Christ, it means to lose one's direction in the Christian race. There are a lot of people, you know, the Bible says to stand for the faith once for all delivered. And a lot of people, that's all they do. They stand or they sit or they wander. It means to lose one's direction. That's what happened, really, in the Old Testament when the children of Israel left the land of Egypt. You see, they had to go through the wilderness, and that was part of God's plan. But they got bogged down in unbelief, and what did they do? They wandered nearly 40 years in that wilderness. Now, the wandering was not a part of God's will. The wilderness experience was, but not the wandering. And that's a great tragedy that many believers who turn their back upon the liberty in Christ and get bogged down in ultra-separation. There's nothing wrong with separation, but ultra-separation and trying to, to uh, being so concerned about crossing of the T's and dotting of the I's that they wander and they lose all sense of direction in the Christian race. Well, he speaks about the uh, liberty and legalism of the Jews and then this liberty in Christ and the license of the libertines. Now, notice verse 13. He said, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty, this liberty, as an occasion to the flesh, but to love one another. See, Paul now warns against the opposite of legalism, which is lawlessness. And by the way, Many lawless people, I don't mean outlaws, but I mean many people that really uh, live a, a very open type of Christian life. I mean, where anything goes, you know, they drink in moderation. And you talk to them, you'll find out that they grew up in a very legalistic system. And you see, in order to get away from that, they sometimes go to the other extreme. And that's often what happens. And so Paul warns against this now, uh, this liberty... Don't go the other extreme, folks. It's liberty, but it's not license. It's not lawlessness. And uh, we're to uh, keep that in mind. And then he speaks of this liberty and the works of the flesh. And he talks about the um, uh, various uh, children uh, that the works of the flesh uh, give forth, uh, some 17 kids, and they're all brats here, he calls them adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. You can read these for yourself. Now, uh, these are not produced by the law, by the way. But these are produced by the flesh. And if a person refuses the liberty in Christ and attempts by the flesh to keep the requirements of the law, these 17 elements will come into his life. Because, you see... It is true, the law warned against them, but the law could give no victory over them. So indirectly, it was just as bad, you see. I mean, you might as well have... Uh, well, what he's saying here is this, that these are the works of the flesh. You're attempting, by the works of the flesh, to keep the law. You're not only not going to keep the law, you can't do that, but you're going to do the opposite than what the law commands you to do, you're going to be guilty, uh, at least uh, mentally, if not physically, of adultery and fornication, uncleanness, and all that. Now, he contrasts the liberty as far as the works of the flesh and this liberty now in Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. And notice also, he does not say fruits in this verse, chapter 5, verse 15, but he says the fruit, he says, are in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 22, rather. But the fruit, not fruits, the fruit 
of the Spirit. You see, all believers get these grapes that has been called the, the grapes of the Spirit here, the cluster of grapes, the fruit of the Spirit. Nine grapes in this cluster, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and that's self-control. Uh, we discussed some time ago the difference between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are plural. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. Uh, we don't get all the gifts. There are 18 gifts, and God may give me four or five, but I don't get all the gifts. But I get all the fruit. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is like a vineyard, and each vineyard has clusters of grapes, and each cluster has nine grapes. And so uh, the, the uh, gifts of the Spirit are like an orchard. And so uh, there's apples, and there's 18 apples hanging from each tree. And I don't get all the apples, but uh, God gives me a few, but he gives me a whole cluster, and I have all the fruit, some of the gifts, but all the fruit of the Spirit. And what a contrast between the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. Now he talks about this liberty and the duty of the believer. You mean a believer has a duty or has duties, and yet he's enjoying the liberty of Christ? Yes. But you see, in this case, duty is the fruit, and grace is the root. The legalist would turn it around, and it would say that duty is the, is the root, and grace is the fruit. In other words, uh, if you work hard enough, you get enough grace. But Paul says, oh no, uh, grace is the root, and because you have obtained grace and mercy, make duty the fruit. Uh, you do your duty not to obtain salvation, but you do your duty because you have obtained salvation. But nevertheless, the believer has certain duties to perform. What is he to do? Well, he is to love his neighbor as himself. What is he to do? He is to be led by the Spirit. He is to reckon himself crucified with Christ. Of course, the legalists would have none of this. They emphasize circumcision and not crucifixion. But the believer is to reckon himself to be crucified with Christ. Then he's to avoid boasting and envy. He's to carefully and prayerfully restore the fallen. He's to bear the burdens of others. And then the Bible says he's to bear his own burdens. What does that mean? Well, it means that he's to carry his own weight. Uh, he's to avoid self-deception. He's to prove himself. He's to financially give to his spiritual leaders, chapter 6, verse 6. He's to properly sow the right habits of life, chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, verse 7, Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth in his, to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now he's talking about believers here. Someone said, if you spit in the wind, you're going to spit in your face. And that's certainly true. They that sow to the wind, the Old Testament says, shall reap the whirlwind. It's also been said that some uh, Christians uh, sow their wild oats all week long and then go to church on Sunday and pray for a crop failure. Uh, but there will be no reduction in the wages of sin, whether it's in the life of a Christian, the life of an unsaved person. Um, Paul says in verse 9, and I need this, and I think you do too. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You're going to reap what you sow. And if you reap to the Spirit, and you reap and the liberty of Christ, you're going, I'm sorry, if you sow to the Spirit, and sow in the liberty of Christ, you're going to reap the same thing. And then he is to do good to all. Verse 10, And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. And then finally, in this liberty that he's been talking about, been exhorting in chapters 5 and 6, this liberty 
and the marks of Paul. Verse 17, Paul says, I, of chapter 6, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What a testimony that is. J. Sidwell Baxter has written, This Galatian epistle was written to a group of believers scattered throughout a rural area in which most of the people were agricultural workers of one sort or another. In keeping with the mentality and circumstances of the Galatians, Paul uses language and metaphors which are specially appropriate to them. There were four kinds of bearing with which the Galatians were familiar above all else. These were fruit-bearing, burden-bearing, seed-bearing, and brand-bearing. For as many of the agricultural laborers were slaves, they were branded to indicate whose property they were. See now how Paul makes use of these things in expounding the true liberty of the Spirit. Fruit-bearing. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. And then he speaks of burden-bearing. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Seed-bearing. Whatsoever man soweth. And then let us be weary in well-doing. Let us sow, for we shall reap. And then brand-bearing. I bear in my body the marks or brands of the Lord Jesus. He goes on to say, Baxter, there were five classes of persons who were branded. Slaves as a mark of ownership. Soldiers as a mark of allegiance. Devotees or worshipers as a mark of consecration. Criminals as a mark of exposure. And the abhorred as a mark of reproach. The marks of the Lord Jesus in the body of Paul were all these five in one. He bore the mark of a slave and of a soldier and of a devoted person, of a criminal as far as the world was concerned, and of the abhorred as far as sinners were concerned. We began this epistle by quoting the first stanza of Philip Bliss. We shall end it by quoting stanzas two and three of his song Once for All. Now we are free. There's no condemnation. Jesus provides a perfect salvation. Come unto me, oh, hear his sweet call. Come, and he saves us once for all. Children of God, oh, glorious calling, surely his grace will keep us from falling. Passing from death to life at his call, blessed salvation once for all. Once for all, O oh sinner, receive it. Once for all, O oh brother, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all.